When you think about Texas, you think about cowboys and cattle. You don't think about cotton and slavery. But that's in the history of this dry, flat, and stiflingly hot East Central Texas. This has been cotton country ever since the time of slavery. After slavery was abolished, this land was worked by dirt poor sharecroppers. I'm meeting two linguists at the country store in Springville, a tiny community sandwiched between two Union Pacific Railroad tracks. For more than 17 years, Guy Bailey and Patricia Sukaravila have been conducting a remarkable piece of research into the language of local African Americans. How you doing? Well, welcome to Springville. Thank you. Welcome to the train. Welcome to the train, welcome welcome to the train right? Yeah, all right, you have these all the time? Yeah, yeah all, About all every the time. A few minutes, right? For generations of sharecroppers, black and white, the country store was the center of their lives. This is where they bought provisions, stores, and tools. And this is where they borrowed money from the white store owner until they sold their cotton. The store has been owned by the same family for more than a century. In many ways, it's hardly changed at all. It's in a kind of time warp. When I first started out with this project, I would sit out at the general store inside and um, basically hang out there most of the day and uh, interact with people who came in and talk with them and not necessarily record right at first um, until I got to know people. Hey, stranger. The mail is still delivered at the store. There is no home delivery. People oftentimes don't just come to get their mail and leave. They come, get their mail, sit down, open it, sit around and talk. Springville is a fictional name Guy and Patricia gave to the community so that local people would feel relaxed in their company. To win their trust, Guy and Patricia also promised them they would use pseudonyms. Willie is a lifelong resident of the area. He grew up on one of the farms close to the store. He's always lived out here and uh, worked in agriculture his whole life. Uh, he's a very good example of what we would call older rural African-American uh, speech patterns. You, you told me that uh, when you were a boy, you did a lot of hunting and stuff? Yes, I hunted a little bit, yes. Sir. What all did you hunt? Armadillo, rabbits, and everything I get. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Is the armadillo pretty good to eat? Yes, sir, he's good, sir. Never had armadillo. What's it taste like? Taste good, like chicken. Is that right? Yes, sir. Sure do, sir. You couldn't rice it. Is that right? How you cook it? Well, my mama, she boiled him and boiled him, you know, in a pot, you know. Uh huh. Put some onion around him and, you know, make gravy out him. What we've been able to do with this research is to look at how things change over time in a single community. We had some hard times in my days. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. We worked hard, sir. Yeah. My daddy. Willie's way of talking can be traced right back to the time of slavery. We know this because one of the things that makes this part of Texas so special is a series of recordings and photographs made here in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, these were pictures that were made by uh, workers for the WPA here in Texas. The top two are uh, from former slaves who were from this district. The others are from slaves in other parts of Texas. You think of slavery being so long ago, so long in the past. So much of it, though, was a 19th century phenomenon. So these people photographed in the late 30s, or 1940 or thereabouts, could actually be the grandchildren or even children of people brought directly from Africa. That's exactly right. Okay, here are some recordings from the Library of Congress with former slaves who were born in Texas. You were born right there and stayed there until I was about nine, ten years old, maybe more. Stayed right there. We didn't know where to go. 
Mm -hmm. Mama them didn't know where to go. You see, after freedom broke, just turned just like he turned something out, you know. They didn't know where to go. That's just where they stayed. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm 61 or two years old, and I never had no trouble in my life. I said, I never asked the noise for a nickel, but they didn't give it to me in my life, and now one of them never trusted me. What is significant to you in the speech patterns on these recordings? They're very different from current day African American vernacular English. Many of the, the features that are most common uh, in what linguists call AAVE, things like invariant B, they be working, or the deleted copula, uh, they working. You don't see as much the invariant B, you don't see it all, here at all in the slave tapes. African-American speech changed in the epic migration of rural southern blacks to the cities of the north. Over many decades, until the 1970s, some six million made that journey. And as always when there are great movements of people, there are also great changes of language. In the cities of the north, the races mixed less than in the rural south. Instead, blacks and their language found themselves isolated in ghettos. In the large cities, you had spatial segregation, but you also had the formation of, of separate communities, often with a kind of oppositional culture to, uh, to the rest of the U.S. This created a, an ideal context for African-American vernacular English to develop along a sort of a separate, a separate track. What we heard in Detroit shows how that separate development continues to this day. I put two extra little loops in there. For a train? Music. While the beat's going? Yeah, like, like when it first started, so you don't got to start. What's the way? Right without, without, without I, I think what you can say is that white speech and African-American speech over the last 150 years or so have developed along different paths. They've had sort of uh, independent development, not influencing each other very much at all. Uh, so that their grammars are very different today, probably more different uh, than they've ever been. And their phonologies aren't very similar, their sound systems aren't very similar either. It's kind of independent development. I suppose you could sum up Springville like this. 150 years ago, rural blacks and whites sounded more alike than you might have thought. But today, whites and inner city blacks sound more different than you might have hoped. After decades of civil rights advances, the implications are pretty sober, because more separate languages mean more separate peoples. Mm -hmm.